Hello and welcome to Bala 2023 at this time. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. Two days after the governorship and at state assembly elections, Nigerians and political parties are still reacting to the outcome of the elections. Tonight, we analyze voter turnout and its effect on the results in various states. On March 18, Nigerians came out to vote for their preferred governorship candidates across the different political parties in 28 states of the Federation. Results from the election exercise are now being announced by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. In many states, the dynamics change after the presidential election, with political parties clinging to victories after losing to the opposition during the 25th of February presidential election. In Lagos, for instance, the All Progressives Congress APC had lost to the Labour Party during the presidential poll, but things changed during the governorship elections held on Saturday. APC's Babajide Somolu has been declared the winner already, while the candidate of the Labour Party, Badebo Rhodes-Viva, came a distant second. The LP's candidate alleges rigging while there were many reported cases of violence and voter suppression during the election. It was the same story in Oyo, where Sheyi Makinde of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, led APC's Teslim following with a wide margin as against what transpired during the presidential election when APC won. In Katsina State, the PDP had won the presidential election, but APC took over the battlefield as INEC announced Diko Rada of the APC as the winner of the election. The outcome of the elections may have seemed to be unpredictable. Well, joining us live to discuss this is Ebenezer Wikina, founder of Policy Shapers. Welcome to the program, Ebenezer. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, we also have Eugene Abels, Executive Director of the Extra Step Initiative. Welcome to the program, Eugene. Thank you for having me. And then we have uh, Angu Ongu, a Public Affairs Analyst. Welcome to the program, Angu. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be in your studios again. Good okay. evening, Nigeria. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, let me begin with you, Ebeniza. You are a campaign strategist. Uh, let us start by describing what you saw in the campaigns leading to the elections of both the 25th of February and uh, that of uh, Saturday. How would you describe the campaign strategies, especially those of the major political parties, and how that will affect our subsequent elections? Yes. Um, well, I mean, as, as we all know, this was a very keenly contested race at, at all, all levels, states, national you know, levels. And one of the major achievements, I think, was that we were able to have a new electoral act. This is something that has been pending for quite a while. I think that that was, that was a good achievement. Um, you know, compensation, civil society, as, as well as other um, you know, organizations were able to push for that to come through. One of the missing things from the campaign, I think, is that you know you want every campaign that follows a political cycle to be about the issues, right? You want the issues to be elevated, you want the challenges to be elevated, and you want those who have the solutions. So it gives it an opportunity for those that have the solutions, you know, to stand and defend their solutions. And I'm talking about a debate. You know, is 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 shocking that in 2023. We were having arguments on whether we should have a debate or we shouldn't have a debate and what the debate is, what the town hall is. And I think that that was one of the major challenges that we that we had in the in the conversation this this time. So from a campaign angle, I think even though the candidates were able to move to various states, you know, we saw some some parties engaging people beyond just the campaign ground to meeting markets, market traders, market women, you know, young people in universities. Those were, those were good things, but I think just that missing bit of having candidates at the national level and most of the state's level, actually, candidates being able to come out and defend their ideas. You know, you know there's, there's something when you say you're a leader, you can stand one hour, two hours talking about the ideas you're passionate about, and you can defend those ideas on national, national TV, right? I think we miss that, that particular part. And so most times, when you don't have the issues being elevated, you don't have issues like tribalism, you know, where's your certificates, all of these other issues that I think are quite flimsy, you know, that then dominate the, the space. So I think moving forward, we need to be able to ensure that our politics is a politics of ideas, ideas, thoughts, intellectualism, where we're able to bring the solutions to the problems and we can argue based on the ideas 
you know, and then not be carried away by all of the tribalism that we saw following um, the, the gubernatorial elections. Well, unfortunately, the person who has been declared president-elect was the one that never attended any debate at all while others were uh, attending debates. But that is where we are right now. Uh, but uh, we will move forward. Let me go to Eugene. Um, one of your favorite quotes, uh, I understand, is that of uh, Patrick Dele Cole, I think. And he says, history is a benign teacher. Only the wise learn from it. Others repeat previous mistakes. Do you think we have learned any lessons from our previous elections that we carried on to this one? And do you think we will ever learn from even this election to make the next elections better? Well, thanks for having me. We have learned nothing. We know the issues, we know the challenges, but because we, the employers of as people, have refused to insist on our right and for them to do the right thing. And a couple of days back, I was just thinking that from the 1967 elections to the what, 60 to all the elections that have taken place, even the issues that led to the Civil War, the issues that led to the military coup of 1983, where Buhari, President Buhari came in, we've always allowed the umpire to come, do, how, do the way they like, and we never audit them or hold them accountable. And people always believe them. People will say, oh, because we don't have laws for protecting people. There are basic fundamental laws that are available for us. We'll give an instance here. For instance, we are witnesses that INEC had to postpone the elections, saying that they only had a set of diverse machines. Meanwhile, the budget had provided for them. I don't have anything for them, for those machines, meaning they could have, I expect that for an election that over 400 billion has been expended, that we should have two sets of that as back of these are incidents. If we, it, so we have learned nothing, particularly with the electorates. We have refused to insist on debates. The way we are going now, I, I think, People expect us to even write it in the Constitution, the Electoral Act, that you must campaign. Because the way it is now, all I need to do is get the party together. I don't need to campaign. I don't need to debate. I get people, boys who have arms, I have money, and I can do the way I like as long as on that day. I can beat up people, take up, but we have learned nothing. We have learned nothing. Only for me this morning to see on a news bar of a TV station, the INEC is saying that in the places where they had issues, there will be no repeat elections. They are not even waiting for the process to be concluded. You, an employee, you're already dictating to us what should happen, that you're not going to revisit certain things. Where are you hurrying to? Where are you running to? I listened to collation in some of the centers there. People are telling the electoral act was designed in such a way that I did not need to go to court. I can cancel results. Then. People are telling you already if there is a discrepancy between what is on, on the INEC server and what this man is announcing here, the least I expect is to see process. Once a challenge has been raised, that result is supposed to be suspended while those things are verified. I, am, I didn't see those processes. Then. All I see and smell is arrogance of our employees against the Nigerian people who are the employers. We have learned nothing. And if we continue in this trajectory, I remember the arrogance of MPN. What a nation. In 1983, Nigeria could not define 12 to third. What made up to 12 to third of states? They, Nigeria is struggling to find something written in black and white, which says, and the federal character uh, territory, Nigeria can define it. Nigeria cannot define the word transmission. That's where we are. And unlearned people, meaning that they're not lawyers, struggled, fought to make sure that the electoral act was amended so that people won't come from one election to the other. And those who are supposed to be custodians of justice, not the law, 
provides a platform for people to violate the system acts and become elected. There's no need for us now. We just tie a fire and carry matches and anybody who takes any territory and begin to rule. If I remember the Imo State incident, I the, the witnesses were from the Nigerian police who are employees of the umpire. The umpire didn't provide those results. What are we? What is wrong with us? Mm. Have we not learned lessons of nations? Mm, yes. Lesser things led us to. I, wh what is wrong with us? I don't mind who wins. They just pretend. Mm. Let me well, that. It really, it really is a, a question that we should be asking ourselves. What is wrong with us? Or like we'll put it in Nigeria. Now, who do us this thing? <laughs> but um, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll, we are hoping that solutions will come someday. And uh, we'll interrogate some of these steps that we need to take before we get to the solutions. Let me go to Angu right now. Angu, uh, the public affairs analyst. But I know that you've had interactions with uh, a lot of youths um, in your capacity as a, a special advisor to the governor on student affairs. You must have interacted with students so much you must have interacted with you so much um, I don't know whenever there's an election whenever we're talking about electing people one of the paramount things is that it this is what is going to define the future which is especially for the youths who are coming up but it, unfortunately is this same youths who are being used to truncate the process of election. They are the ones that are the thugs, they are the ones that snatch the ballot boxes, they are the ones who, who cause mayhem in so many places and all that. And I, I'm just wondering, what is it that is lacking? Is it in the educational system or in the schools themselves that needs to be addressed so that this youth will know their own worth beyond just being thugs? Is there a problem that we are, we are missing and that we're not looking at in your interaction? Uh, with the students, what can you say about that? Why do they do what they do and what can be done uh, to make sure it doesn't happen again? All right, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> it's quite unfortunate that Nigeria is uh, where we are today. And just like the last speaker said and postulated, it's, uh, it's worrisome. Uh, that we are taking ourselves back into the day. And the MPN days where leaders conducted themselves as if they were gods. Uh, and the last speaker said, look, maybe we just <laughs> tie up and carry machete and go and look for a territory and, you know, conquer such a territory and be become the lord uh, or an emperor over such territory. Uh, looking at the, the, the elections conducted so far, uh, it's it's obvious that the processes are the processes that are chewing up so-called leaders in our nation, you know, are fraudulent, uh, not reflecting the wish of the Nigerian people. And to back to your question, to say, look, it is the young people that most times are used to uh, do ballot bus snatching, and, you know. But I want to say the question is not really the question of the young people. Because these young people are led like sheep to the slaughter, and at times they have nothing to do. Because those that have brought these young people to that place of them becoming used, it is the same political class that, that have refused to develop the nation, that have refused to give these young people opportunities to better their lives, and for a number of them, they see it as a means of survival because uh, poverty has been weaponized in Nigeria by our elected leaders. So you see that they hoard monies, 
They hold even opportunities. They hold even gifts. And wait for a week to the election to become philanthropists. Some of the state governors, a week to elections, they donate motorbikes, they donate cars, they give cash gifts. Why are they doing that? They, because they know the people need it. They themselves have weaponized poverty. And they now use it as a tool to uh, hoodwink uninformed young people to become part of their demonic agenda to perpetuate themselves as wicked leaders over this country. And I would like to say enough is enough. Our young people need to wake up. Our young people need to begin to say, look, enough is enough. I'm not going to allow myself to be a talk to any politician. And you were asking, what is the problem? We have a citizen, a citizenry, that is not informed. We have a citizenry that is not ready to engage. And I was talking to, you know, some elders recently. I was like, look, you people bequitted this dosa kind of citizenry to us. If you people have fought for social justice, the way some of us are doing today, Nigeria will not be where it is today. We we'll become so relaxed as young people. We don't even know how to demand for our rights. And that has been the problem. And the political class knowing it, the corrupt political class, are, when I say the po political class, I don't mean all of the political class is corrupt. But the corrupt ones knowing that, knowing that this citizenry, uh, this citizenry is not informed, this is is uh, Lassadessica or is unconcerned, they know that whatever they do, they can go away with it. And that is a problem. Mm. And it is high time, uh, I would like to speak to Nigerian youth, this is the only country we have, it is high time we begin to rise up and demand for social justice in this nation. Let our institutions be accountable to us. The last speaker said, we are the employers of these institutions. We pay tax, one way or the other, to keep these institutions flowing. The oil uh, revenue that is used to run these institutions, it's right here, it's our patrimony. So, our young people need to begin to ask questions about the system. Ask questions on how can the system work for us better? And by the time we begin to ask questions, nobody will take any young person for granted. Mm. So I, I like the Nigerian them. young like people needs to awaken. We are, we are we are we are we are sleeping. We are in slumber. Okay. And they like okay. Like okay. Let 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 Eugene let Eugene just add something I like there. I in. I want to go to a better side, but Eugene, just just your thoughts yes, now. Let me just jump in here because of uh, the things my brother just said. Number one. In our time, when we were in university, we had just um, encyclopedias, which Daddy had in his library. Now we have Google in our hands. There's no kind of, now we even had chat so There's no kind of information you want to know how to have. Mm. In our time, I tell them, particularly this sudden rave, which we have all the videos. I say, you think that the democracy you're enjoying like this just fell from them. People died. In case you have forgotten, let me remind you. Emko Abiola, General Abacha, Abiola's wife, and several others who were victims of the Sergeant Rogers and the death squad them in Nigeria for this democracy to come. The likes of a uh, tempo was being published today. The Iron Anuka that is behaving, misbehaving. They were on a they were on a they were a guerrilla publishing outfit. We had to look for them to read, to do our little things. This democracy just didn't fall from heaven. It just didn't fall. Yes, and he said to another thing that we created the facility. No, it's not true. Yes, it's not true. You remember 
Dr. Re Re Beko Ransom Kuti, Nigerian Medical Association. If I don't mention the association, then you will have forgot. You forgot it that it exists. The bank, Beko and group made it almost like a civil society group. For every issue that affected society, they were on the streets. Is it gunifying? Even though first of all, is an investment that he had this problem. Returning in this grave because that's not what we hoped festivals would turn out to be. And so, is it Ghani? Is it Fela? The songs were there, they were all written. Is it Claude? Is it Patrick Wilma? Is it Palaus Is Mohammed? Is it Aisha Mohammed? These were all people. We can see these were people who were then the likes of Shimon, they were playing with the military and forming labor movements. So, everything is in your hand as an electronic gadget, all this information. Is that the people have refused to ask questions? So even in 2015, when they were saying they wanted to vote, I said, Do you know the people you're voting for? What are you aspiring for? Look at what has happened in Lagos now. Because they said, Let us not do LUP. A nice young man like Banky W has become a victim. For you to have education, there's one of the streets, there's one that's academic. The antecedents of Banky W, particularly during the surprise. Everybody knows that. Why will he lose an election in his natural constituency? It is not our fault. The people, when you hear today, politician beats his chest and say, I'm on ground. He's not sharing ice cream. It means he has a group of young men who are ready to bear arms. And I give them practical example. The amount of weapons in the system, if we had them back in the 80s, we would have probably had the democracies faster than now. In 1984, when a girl was killed in Zaria, all the SUG male president ran away. The women, the girls, held the Buhari administration down. The whole universities were shut down. Girls, not by the company secretary of Skybank, the former company secretary, she led that movement. Nationwide, it, it didn't matter where you came from. Then we didn't have the SL, we had Nigeria security organization. Same thing. That was S which became the SSS and became the SSS. The question here is, just like the way my brother ended, he was said that it's time for us to begin to ask questions. Where did we get this evil perception that professors will be the one who run elections? Is it every but, professor that is competent? But but are they not supposed to be the eggheads that should know what they do? Because they say Indeed, someone who is the, educated cannot be enslaved. And these same professors the of, are the, the ones that are, sorting, are doing what they're doing. Where sorting has become institutionalized, hmm. where we have situations that some professors, the things they claim are not true, hmm. where they fight the lobby governors to be posted. Two years, three years before elections, governors ensure that a particular list of professors are posted in particular areas. Don't we know these things? It is time to have an independent electoral body, and it must be subject to public scrutiny. From your expenses to how you conducted it, we must insist on it. It deserves a truth and reconciliation commission to be set up so that people are held accountable. If okay. you want to be a native doctor, but if you hold that position, and you do not perform on it, right? Or you are found liable. Either you, your purchasing was overvalued. You cannot just be protected by the next administration. Okay. But all of this cannot happen if the people are not ready to hit the streets. Okay. You see uh, why let, you should respect Zelensky, yeah. the so-called comedian who has stood and faced a bully like Russia. You see what's happening in Paris. People for a slight reform for. For, for, for pensioners pension from 64 years to 65 years, people have been on the streets. See what's happened in Israel six weeks, they've been on the street. See what happened in Hong Kong, that is not the street and dollars a week. And we're here forming, hoping for India to come down and pay for us. No, if you have decided you've chosen a part to pacify a bully, okay, let, you know, let, let me hear, let me hear from Ebeniza as well. Ebeniza, you sit in council, UK and other global, uh, global uh, organizations. You also deal with the youths and all that. And if there is a rot, uh, correction has to start from somewhere. 
is there hope that we can have a new breed of youths that will be asking the relevant questions? Because it's not just act, action all the time. When you ask the relevant questions, maybe you just get the right answers and then people will sit up. But what is that thing that is lacking? How can we cultivate this kind of youths that will be uh, always scrutinizing what the government is doing and everybody who is holding a position of authority and all that, not just rebelling all the time anyway, but how can we cultivate this youth that will be asking the relevant questions and make people sit up? That's the question I'm asking you, Ebenezer, because you've had experience globally you're sitting in council everywhere. And in fact, I know that you are, you, uh, you're sitting in the British Council, UK, Africa, New Narrative Youth Agency, and your credentials are long. So let us, let us try to have a peek into what we need to do uh, to get things going differently from how it is going now. Yes. No, no, I, I, I totally agree with a lot of, um, of what, um, you know, one of our, our leaders in the social movement space, you know, Mr. Mr. Eugene Evels, and what Honorable Angler has said too. I, I agree with Mr. Eugene that there is a lot of, you know, there's, there's a gap in historical ed education. You know, most of what I feel like I know today about Nigeria has been either from listening to people like, like him or attending events or Googling, <laughs> right? The, the, the fact that we miss history in our, in our curriculum is one of the biggest, I think it's a, I, I even think it's a, it's a crime that you don't teach the next generation, you know, what they should know about their past. And that's why you hear things like, well, we've not had, you know, what Mr. Ango was saying earlier that about previous generations not, not being active. I mean, you've, you've had one of the most active, women had started social movements as far back as 1929. When you had the about about, about women's women. revolts, you know, yeah. up until the Egbala and women's revolt. So, so you've had women leading. I had young people leading SSUGs. I mean, the, m most most of most of the military administration. It was students, as as Mr. Eugene said, it was students that actually stood up to fight for, for democracy. Students and civil society and various trade trade unions. So, I think that is it's a missing gap in education, and not just education as intellectual education, but even moral education. You know, when you see the conversations that followed the the election, especially especially in, in Lagos, most of the people who were saying, you know, you're not from Lagos, go to your state and vote, they were they were young people, right? So I, I think it's that lacking moral education where society is becoming so porous where we accept anything. We're accepting you're accepting Yahoo boys. We feel like it's okay for a boy to scam people and make money online and bring it to his family and the parents collect it, right? We are we're accepting that it's okay for a girl to sleep around as far as she's she, she's not getting pregnant, as far as she's getting her grades higher, you know, we feel like it's fine. So I think it's that moral it's that moral education that is something that is missing. As for how I think we can resolve it, I mean this is a this is an existential question, right? But I think this is one of the reasons why we set up policy shapers. Um, we set up policy shapers in 2020 because we see that democracy needs to go beyond the ballot. You know, in Nigeria, there's a lot of focus on the election time, and you know, people almost sleep and wake up and it's two two months to the election. Get your PVC, get your PVC, prepare to vote. They don't care what has happened with the budget over the past four, four years. They don't care what has happened with appointments. They don't care who has solved what what problems, etc. So I think that it's ensuring that people are able to engage in democracy beyond the ballot, right? Let's even say that all of this happens, the court cases happen, nothing changes, and we're left with the leaders that we have currently. How do we even begin to engage them on the day-to-day, -day, right? How do we begin to question them? And if we even need to hit the streets, it wouldn't even just be about the issues like the way they voted. It wouldn't be about basic issues like, why are they not removing subsidy yet? Why is subsidy still, still there now? They say subsidy should have been taken away and it's still there. Or why is the education budget at 5%? Over the past 10 years, we've not spent more than 8% of our, of our national budget on education. And we want to build the smartest young people in the, the, in the world, and you cannot invest in their human capital development. So that's something you should hit the streets for. Oh, why is our security, you know, security architecture struggling? You know, you have the police, you have all these arms who are struggling for, for so many years. Funding is low. Even when there's funding, there's low stewardship. And, you know, I agree with, um, with Mr. Eugene very well when he says, Academia might not even be the solution to our electoral problems. Look at, look at academia. Every time ASU goes on strike, right? And when they go on strike, there's money released. Has there been any stewardship for that money over the past how many years, right? You know, we just hear that, oh, there's extra money released to, to universities. 
Universities do not produce financial reports. We don't know what is spent. We don't know where funding is coming from. You know, they just keep asking for more money over and over and over again. So I think it, it needs more of a concerted effort. And to get the young people who will begin to ask questions, we need to look at our education sector, especially moral education. And we need to find ways to engage young people. And this is civil society organizations, media, engage young people beyond just election season. You know, you know how the media is now at the at the height for, for election conversation. Very soon now it's become Big Brother in Nigeria, football, you know, everything just dies down. <laughs> everything just, it just follows a, a call. Everything dies down. How do we keep the conversation going every day? How do we ensure that people ask the right questions and the media is prompting those questions in their minds to ensure that those issues of governance remain at the top of young young people's minds? I think that's that, that's the way we can solve this, this problem. Okay, let me come to an angle. Maybe it's a, a bit of a digression, but it's the same. Uh, it will go to the same place because we've talked about poverty and some of the things are blamed on poverty, especially when the youths take up arms uh, and we talk about poverty being weaponized and all that. Is the society really that bad that you have to to arm yourself and do wrong before you can make a living. For instance, you are a young man. Uh, you are a crypto enthusiast, which means you know that there are other avenues to make money. Do, does it need to be, or do you need to be a superpower or a superman or a, a superhero before you can, you can have a stream of income that you don't really have to rely on doing wrong in the society? Can you can you take the question again? Do you really think it's a matter of poverty that makes the youth do what they do? Because you, I said that you are a crypto enthusiast, isn't it? Which means there are opportunities in our in our society. What is it that is so difficult that these youths cannot go into these other forms of money making, except they take arms and fight for politicians? Why should it always be blamed on poverty when there are other opportunities? Or do they need extra powers to be able to do that? You want me to rephrase again? Hello, Angu. Yes. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. There are several other opportunities uh, that our young people can harness in order to hello angu is it that we've lost the audio or something okay uh, uh angu is gone as it is uh, we're hoping that he can rejoin us uh, in the course of this discussion but in the meantime we're still here with uh, Ebenezer Wikina founder of policy shapers and Eugene Abel's executive director uh, the extra step initiative uh, we just said um, Angu's audio we've lost Angu's audio he's honorable Angu Ongu a public affairs analyst but we'll just take a short break now and return to continue with the discussion gentlemen don't go away and those of you watching us please stay tuned it's still ballot 2023 and we have a Beniza week in our founder uh, policy shapers Eugene Abel's executive director the Extra Step Initiative, and Honorable Angu Ongu, a public affairs analyst. We're talking about our Nigeria, because whatever happened on the 25th of February and last Saturday, uh, we have a lot, a lot of things to talk about, a lot of things to talk beyond this season, beyond even May 29th and all that. So it's better to start uh, uh, with the small steps now and begin to exhume some of the things that we need to address so that they do not fester in our community and make Nigeria what we don't want it to be. It's already what we don't want it to be, but it shouldn't be worse than how it is right now. So let me begin with you, uh, come back rather to you, uh, Eugene. We need to start interrogating this kind of things. We need to start um, setting an agenda for us, the people, because you did mention that we are just docile. We are just sitting back and relaxed and we're not doing enough. We're not asking the right questions. From here on out, what are those things that the citizens need to start doing if they are not doing already uh, or if they are doing it and they are not doing it enough? What are those things that we need to start doing now to make sure that 
Well, the deed has been done. Whoever wins uh, has won. And no matter the outcome of the, the litigations that are flying up and down, uh, we have a Nigeria to protect. But what are the things that we, sh we can do to change the narrative from just being, you know, you have won, do whatever you like to do, and another four years we start scrambling to see how we can elect somebody else. So tell us some of these things that we need to be doing as citizens. Yeah, in my last TED talk, TED Expert talk, I said that advocacy in society with failed public institutions amounts to nothing. And um, public institutions will not become strong except the people demand and insist on it. Now, when these elections were to start, we exhausted the initiative. We said that it is not a sprint, just like um, Ebenezer mentioned earlier. It's a marathon. So why we want to advocate for a solution? Because this conversation make no meaning if we don't recommend ways for I am using this opportunity to call on every aggrieved person and every successful person that whoever won the elections, please do not blame Paula Tinibu. Do not blame Peter B for losing. Blame the institutions and those giving responsibilities to you. Now they're pointing in a direction to the judiciary. We were here, the certain governor built houses for judicial officers. We're here, some have been made life ventures without being in court. So this is when the marathon begins. We all must get interested in the cases. The day of court sitting, we all go to court so that they know and they feel you. They feel our like bad body odor and everything. They'll smell it. They'll see the pressure. We must be interested with, for those who won, yes, yeah, so that you don't lose your mandate. For those who lost, so that you can redeem it. In, in, even if you don't redeem it, you will ensure that certain things are done properly. The, the electoral process is not entirely a civil one. When there are crimes that have been committed, if there are evidence of contracts being inflated or broken electoral matter, people, there are lots of young lawyers that can carry out class actions and demand the minimum place, code of conduct bureau, against those professors. Then. Yes, let's put, we, we, this is the time. Let us use the state institutions that we must come out of our comfort zones. And that's your, you went to, you schooled in England, you have the law to be your fault to back. Go to court. That's how we, they did it in the past. Don't look for support. Go to court and challenge it. Let them have two million cases. Every day that the major political actors will sit in your area, we all go there. We go to court. We get involved. We begin to learn processes. When I'm a bathroom lawyer, I can speak aspects of the law. I can't stand in court to defend you if I am here. But like, I can have a comfortable conversation with you because I've taken time to read the things that concern me. So this is where we need to start from. There's an examination right now before us. And that examination is where all those who won are pointing to. All those who committed crimes are pointing to. Say, go to court. Let all of us go to the court. And let us see that when they go to sit, they see 3,000, 4,000 people standing outside, not hired crowd, then they will begin to yeah. Then the young people that we think are not organized, are the people who make up black acts, eh? uh, call those groups there, um, Icelanders. Uh, they're different in different parts of the country. Nasarawa Maris, Zamfara Brigades, they are all called groups, and they are they have a command and control pattern. Meaning that they have people, they obey orders, they take instructions. They have intelligence units. All we're saying, those resources now, apply them to put pressure on the system. I'm not saying you should anybody. I'm saying you can retrieve information which you can feed to people because you have networks. That man who is you're being loyal to is ensuring that you remain in perpetual poverty so that he will be loyal to him. So he gives you handouts. At most, he buys you a 9,000 
a 2,000 Camry and you come and post it on Facebook or Instagram and say, oh, praise the Lord, this man has done well. It's your money. According to my brother, Henry, we said they come and be philanthropic when election <laughs> comes. So this exam is before us now. Let every obedient, every articulated, every uh, bat, let us all go to court so that the Supreme Court judges and the lawyers know, know that we are all interested, we are sitting with you, we are reading it, we are sharing it publicly and hashtagging judicial players all over the world. Has it not worried you people that every year in exam pass session, they will have a party, a conference that they spend over a billion naira. But it takes politicians to uh, them to exploit aspects of the constitution that now forces us to run to the National Assembly. Ah, we didn't know that you didn't need a certificate to be president of Nigeria. Did we know? We didn't know. Beverly mm -hmm. Nigerian Association sits. Why don't the Nigerian Association create sessions where chapters of the constitutions are come to shreds you know, by groups of study groups then, and it is debated. May I remind all of us here, some of you were not here then. When Bangladesh took over power, he wanted to take the IMF loan and apply austerity measures and do a structural adjustment. Mm. And yeah. the students resisted him. He said, okay, yeah. there was not a national debate all over Nigeria. Yapalo, in Ajeguli, in, uh, in just every year, people were discussing the, the Brenton Woods organization. We all now had to learn about the IMF World Bank where they had operated. Everybody, because everybody wanted to sound intelligent. So you had to go and read about this organization. Who have they given loans to? What have they done to do? Then the primary example was Brazil because they were so indebted. But they were able to translate that debt into industrial investment. So when they found oil, today okay. they've taken it to the next level. So let me not take everybody's time. Okay, <laughs> yeah. There's an exam before us. Okay. Let my honor to speak. Okay, wise words. Um, let me just take uh, very briefly from uh, 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 Beniza and uh, Angu, just very briefly because we have run out of time. Uh, so let me begin with you, Beniza. A final word to yes. especially the youths, because they are yes. no. the leaders of now, not just tomorrow, but from now. Mm. Yes, no, no, I, I, I support everything Mr. Algina has said around ensuring that we begin from, from now, not saying later, you know, from the court cases, ensuring, in fact, there's a petition currently on our chain.org platform that's asking that, you know, the court sessions be, be televised or at least be given some bit of press coverage so that there's a daily press, you know, following so that people can know what's happening today, what's happening tomorrow, mm. who is coming in with the next witness and everything. And I think if we're able to push that through and the Supreme Court agrees agrees to that, that would be a huge step, you know, in the right direction where people can begin to follow that, follow that proceeding. Mm. The next thing is I think that we need to begin to challenge. So if we want to have a politics of ideas, I think it's for young people to also begin to bring their ideas to solve the various sectors. So sometime last year, we, we organized something called the Niger Policy Hackathon. The Niger Policy Hackathon, you know, was a 48-hour session. It was virtually on, on Zoom. We brought close to 200 young people across Nigeria together, you know, from Safara, Imo, Abia, everywhere, to, to think of the various issues that face young people, unemployment, education, insecurity, you know, and how would they, if they were policymakers, solve those issues? This was policy shapers organized this, you know, for, for young people. And it was interesting. You know, all the young people formed various groups. They broke into various thematic groups, worked virtually uh, using WhatsApp and Zoom and just communicating.